Hi, welcome. In this session, I'd like to return to topic I talked about and wrote about about a year ago, which is ESG. In that post and session that I did a year ago, I called ESG the most overhyped, oversold concept in the history of business. And perhaps I was guilty of hyperbole, but I heard from a, quite a few of you. Some of you agreed with my point of view that ESG was being oversold, but quite a few of you pushed back saying that I was missing the good that was being done by ESG, the changes were happening in the space because of it. Now, in keeping with my belief that you learn more from people who disagree with you than people who agree with you, I kept my, my door open to arguments for why ESG makes sense, but I'll make a confession. A year in and having read every conceivable argument for ESG, I'm more convinced than ever that ESG is not just overhyped and oversold, but it's become a gravy train for all the people who make money in ESG. And none of those people are in the group that ESG is supposed to help. Society, employees, customers, whoever ESG is supposed to help. So I'll start by reviewing some of the things I said in my last post, but rather than repeating what I said, I'm going to add to the points I made that. The first point I made in my last post was that ESG is going to be difficult to measure. Why? Because goodness is difficult to measure. Unlike profitability or market cap, where you and I can agree on how to measure those, goodness is a function of our value systems. And we bring very different value systems, reflecting what we learn from family, from religion, from culture, from our, I mean, basically it reflects about different people. So it's no surprise then that ESG scores that come from different services to the same company have very low correlation. That's one of the pr problems we've always had with ESG scores. Now, there are some who seem to think that this, these are just growing pains, that as um, ESG services keep going, that there will be convergence. And if there is, it's only because they've got the check boxes lined up, because there will never be convergence of goodness. As I, because as I said, what you think is critical and what I think is valuable or important is always going to be different from a social issue standpoint. In fact, I saw a post, uh, and this was on ESG, and, um, the, and this particular person had done a survey of investors on what they thought the most critical ESG value should be. And not surprisingly, they found, found big differences. In fact, they offered five different values, global warming, impact of plastic on oceans, sustainability, data fraud, theft, and gun control. And they found that younger investors were more likely to pick global warming and older investors were more likely to pick data fraud. But even within investor groups, notice how much of a spread there is on which value each group puts as the most critical one. So if your, your key issue is climate change, clearly you're going to pick very different companies as good companies than if my issue is gun control. No. Now, having had a few years to observe ESG services come up with scores, we've learned a few things about these scores and they should trouble us. One of the things we're learning is that bigger companies seem to score better on ESG. This is actually three different services and this study looked at ESG scores based upon the size of the company. Not surprisingly, in every service they found that larger companies did much better on ESG scores than smaller companies. Now, you might take this as an indicator that big companies are better corporate citizens than smaller companies, but maybe my, my more cynical side says maybe big companies have more time and more resources to play the ESG score game better than small companies do. In addition, talking about disclosure, there's a second force that seems to come into play that's, again, a little troubling. This is actually from a JP Morgan study of ESG where they looked at the number of ESG disclosure items growing over time, if you look between 2013 and 2019, the number of items has grown from close to 300 to close to 400. It's about a third increase in the number of items. Now, as the number of disclosure items has gone up, ESG scores collectively for companies has also gone up. Again, if you're an ESG defender, you might say this shows that disclosure makes companies better companies. And that would be the equivalent of saying confession makes you a better person because you get all the sins off your chest. But again, the cynical side of me says that maybe this game of disclosure has allowed companies to see what services used to, to rank companies and give them those scores. So as you see ESG scores explode around you for companies, be a little wary about what they're measuring. The second point I made in my last post was about the link between ESG and value. Of course, I did this in response to the arguments I kept hearing that good companies are more valuable. Stated as a fact, 
an assertion rather than with, with backed up by evidence. So as somebody who works in the space, I said, okay, show me. If ESG is good for value, where does it show up? And I have a very simplistic perspective on valuation for, for ESG to affect value. It's got to show up either as higher cash flows or as lower discount rates. So I decided to take a look again at the collective evidence on ESG and broke it down based on the metric you're focused on. So if you look at uh, revenue growth and you look at the empirical evidence and the link between ESG and growth, there's very little evidence that good companies grow at higher rates faster than, than bad companies. In fact, if there's any evidence is that being good puts a scaling limit on you. That when people talk about a Patagonia and ask why Nike can't do what Patagonia does, well, the reason is simple. Nike has revenues multiple factors larger than Patagonia. Patagonia can afford to do some things that Nike can never do. So if there is evidence on the link between ESG and revenue growth, it's probably negative. On the link between ESG and profitability, there are more studies that find good news than bad news. In other words, good companies have higher profitability, but there are quite a few studies that actually show that good companies are less profitable, often because it's spend, they have to spend the money to be good. Now, even if you accept the, that, that, that there are more studies that find a link between good companies being profitable and good companies being less prof, more profitable than less profitable, there is a problem that these studies share that they cannot eliminate easily, which is it's very difficult to, to get a sense of the direction of causation. Now you're saying, what are you talking about? Now, I'm going to give you an analogy, and uh, forgive me for, for, for going off on a tangent, but this analogy will bring home the point. What if I told you that, uh, that if you want to get rich, you should shop at Whole Foods? That I found that shopping at Whole Foods makes you wealthier. You're saying, that's absurd. How can shopping at an upscale grocery store make me richer? I back it up with evidence. I show you that there's a high positive correlation between how much people shop at Whole Foods and how rich they are. You can already see the flaw in that statement, right? It's not that shopping in Whole Foods make you, makes you richer, it's being richer allows you to shop at Whole Foods. You're saying, what's this got to do with the link between ESG and profitability? Well, now if your argument is that good companies are more profitable, I could push back and say, maybe it's because more profitable companies can afford to do the things that make them look good. How do you to tell me that one explanation is better than the other? It's very difficult to disentangle. So even though there is more evidence that ESG is good for profitability than bad for it, it's kind of shaky. If you look at the ESG effect on reinvestment efficiency, it's pretty neutral. There are very few studies that directly test to see whether being good makes you more efficient as an invest, uh, uh, in your investments. But there's some weak evidence based upon the link between ESG and returns and capital that these studies claim to show, and maybe they have the backing for it, that good companies have higher returns on capital than bad companies. And again, though, the causality is, is tough to disentangle. Or do good companies have higher returns on capital, or does having higher return on capital allow you to the, the freedom to do things that make you look good? So if you ask me to summarize what the evidence tells me about the link between ESG and cash flows, my consensus view based upon all the studies I've looked at is there's perhaps very weak evidence that ESG makes you have higher cash flows. In fact, there's more evidence that it does nothing or perhaps slightly hurts your cash flows than helps. Let's turn to the discount rate. And here there is a little bit more good news, but it's kind of focused. Do good companies have lower costs of capital, lower discount rates than bad companies? Yes, but with two caveats. First is it's not that good companies are able to raise money at a lower cost of equity and a lower cost of debt, it's that bad companies seem to be penalized. They have to pay higher rates when they borrow money or face higher costs of equity. Why? Because investors refuse to buy their shares. So if there is any evidence, it's that bad companies get punished with higher discount rates, but much of that evidence comes from the fossil fuel space. I'll wager if you took fossil fuel companies out of your sample, even this link would disappear. There is some evidence that being a bad company also exposes you to failure risk. Why? Because you're more crises, more catastrophes. But if there is any evidence, and this is perhaps the strongest evidence for ESGs, it's that bad companies can get punished with higher discount rates and higher risk. 
So what would I garnish from all of this evidence? If I were advising a company, I would tell them not to be bad because it could hurt them. But if they ask me, should I spend more money to be extra good? My response based on what I see in these studies is no, if you do it, do it for your own sake, but you're not gonna get a higher value. In fact, you might end up with a lower value if you're spending way too much money trying to be extra good. Which brings me to the, to the other pitch that your ESG advocates make. In addition to telling companies they will become more valuable if they're good companies, they also tell investors that they will earn higher returns if they invest in good companies. This I have never been able to buy into for two reasons. One is it's internally inconsistent. Let me, let me explain what I mean when I talk about when I say internally inconsistent. If you remember the strongest evidence, and this is on the last page for ESG comes from looking at bad companies and seeing that they have higher discount rates, higher cost of debt and higher cost of equity. But if you buy into that evidence, you know what it means as an investor, right? Investing in good companies then will give lower returns than investing in bad companies because if equity, good companies are able to raise money at lower rates because they're good companies, you're accepting lower returns. But there's a second problem with these studies and they're fundamentally incoherent and here's why. I've read studies that look at ES, the link between ESG and returns and having established that good companies earn higher returns, they say, hey, that shows that ESG is good for companies. I'm not sure how you come to that conclusion because all you get when you look at the returns from different investment strategies is not a measure of the underlying factors, but what the market is pricing in. Let me explain what I mean by this. I mean, if you think about the effect of ESG and value, it can increase value for some companies, decrease value for others, leave value unchanged for a third group. Now, whether you make money or not has nothing to do with what ESG does for value. Instead, what it depends on is what the market is pricing in. If the market is overestimating the benefits of being good and or the costs of being bad, investing in bad companies will actually deliver higher risk adjusted returns than investing in good companies. If the market is fairly estimating the benefits of being good and or the costs of being bad, investing in good companies will generate roughly the same risk adjusted returns as investing in bad companies. If the market is underestimating the benefits of being good or the costs of being bad, then investing in good companies will generate risk higher risk adjusted returns than investing in bad companies. Do you see where I'm going with this, right? If you see a paper that claims that investing in good companies delivers excess returns, positive returns, that paper is telling you nothing about whether ESG is good for value or bad for value. All it's telling you, uh, uh, no, what all it's conveying is what the market is pricing in, whether it's doing overestimating, underestimating, or fairly estimating the benefits of being good or bad. In steady state, if the evidence is right on the link between ESG and discount rates, that good companies have lower cost of equity and debt, as investors, you learn lower returns, not higher returns. Does this mean that ESG investing is destined for lower returns? Well, there is one potential area of promise. Remember I said that if markets underestimate the benefits of being good or the costs of being bad, there is potential money to be made as markets fully adjust. If you're able to get in on that transition period, you can make money. And perhaps this explains one of the few places where you see ESG investors making money. The first is when you see activist ESG investors. These are investors who target bad companies and make them behave better. And then they benefit because markets reward these companies. Transition returns. I recently saw a study from an investment fund that claimed to that companies which saw improvements in ESG were actually much better investments than companies that didn't see the improvement. Now, before I give the study too much credit, I should note that the study comes from an investment fund with a proprietary ESG score. So it's tough to know what's happening in that black box. And the fund is after all marketing itself on the fact that they can make money on this course. So I'm not sure how much value to attach to it, but maybe focusing on companies which improve their ESG and getting ahead of the game is a way to make money. But if this is why you are in this space, be very clear on what strengths you need to bring to the table. If you're gonna make money on ESG transitions, your skill set is not financial. It should be the social sciences. You're able to detect what society overall cares about, get ahead of the game. 
and then invest based on that, those presumptions. And if you're right, you could make money. Which brings me to my the final question, which is often I'm asked, what difference does it make whether ESG is good for companies or investors? It's good for society. That's why we should do it. But is that true? I mean, implicit in this push for ESG seems to be the belief that the old way where companies focused on being good businesses was somehow giving nothing back to society. That's not true, though, right? I mean, I'll give you two examples, and these are two anecdotal examples, but take them for what they're worth. Take Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, two men who built extraordinarily valuable companies. You know, Bill Gates built Microsoft, you know, and they built it by focusing on the business first. Doesn't mean they didn't factor in goodness, but goodness was a factor only if it contributed to making these companies more valuable. The reason I focus on these two men is they're also part of the giving place. They created this place where they promised to give away the bulk of their wealth during their lifetimes, and they've delivered on that promise. And along the way, they've made millions of people wealthy. Imagine investing in Berkshire Hathaway in the 1960s and how much money you'd have. And those people have been charitable as well. Do you see where I'm going with this, right? In a sense, if you think of this as the old model, in the old model, companies focused on being good businesses, delivered wealth to their shareholders, and shareholders and founders then decided that they would be charitable with that wealth. They would, give, they would pick the charity of their choice, but they chose where they would give the money to society. What the ESG folks would have us do is outsource our giving. Rather than have the old model, they say e companies should be doing the giving for shareholders. They're going to decide what's good or bad for you. And remember, basically what you're doing here is you're outsourcing your value system to corporate CEOs. Now, maybe it's a better system. I'm not, I can't prove it's not, but I'm not going to take this lying down. I know I'm a shareholder in both Uber and JP Morgan. And you no, know, while I like Dara Koshrowski and Jamie Dimon as CEOs, I don't trust them to find the right causes to give to on my behalf. So maybe the way to think about the old model and the new model is who does the giving rather than whether there's giving in the first place. So let's talk about, given all these weaknesses of ESG, why ESG has become this force that pushes through. I think um, if you want to read a very interesting perspective on ESG, I strongly recommend this piece written by Tariq Fancy, who uh, worked at BlackRock as the Chief Investment Officer for Sustainable Investing. He was at the heart of the ESG movement, at uh, the largest investment fund in the world. And he wrote a really thought-provoking piece. And so he's more, you know, I would strongly recommend you read the piece. It's in Medium. And he argues that trusting companies and investment funds to take care of society is fundamentally destined to fail because ultimately companies are driven by profits and investment funds by returns. And for them, ESC will always, what's good for society will always have to take a backseat. And he believes that, that, um, that governments and regulators have fallen short. They've been derelict in passing, writing laws and rules and allowed companies to step into the void. Now, I don't share Tariq's faith in governments being the ultimate solution, but I, I, I share his view that companies and investment funds are ill-suited to be the uh, protectors of society. So let's talk a little bit about why then, if there are so many weaknesses in this space, does the ESG bandwagon keep rolling? I think the answer is a lot of people are making money on ESG. In fact, I'm gonna probably get some backlash for this picture, but I call this my ESG gravy circle. There are four boxes in the circle. There are ESG disclosures, ESG rankings, ESG investment, and ESG consulting. So let's start with the disclosures. Clearly, the beneficiaries, and with each one, I'm going to follow the Latin adage, who benefits? Cui bono? Okay. When you look at disclosures, the push for more disclosures, not surprisingly, comes from accounting firms. Why? Because if you have more disclosures, somebody's got to put these disclosures together. And I'm sure every accounting firm is building a team that's going to help you do that better. So there's fees. And, and again, there's nothing venal about this, but accounting firms are going to push for more disclosure. They take those disclosures, they feed them to ESG services that measure ESG. 
the ESG services use these disclosures to come up with ESG scores and rankings for companies or to create ESG indices. Now, along the way, guess what ESG services are going to do? They're going to lobby for more disclosure because it'll allow them to build even more proprietary ESG scores. So it's a very symbiotic system where disclosure people push their disclosures to ESG services, services push back and ask for more disclosure. Now, both accountants and services walk away as beneficiaries. Now, what do ESG services do with their ESG scores and rankings? They push them out to investment funds. What do investment funds do with them? They create either passive ETF indices or ESG indices built around uh, ETFs or indices built around ESGs, or they actively invest based on ESG and they charge you fees for it. So clearly investment funds are benefiting because they you know, BlackRock's ETF, uh, you know, they have these ESG funds and the fees on those funds are two, three times larger than on their traditional funds. They make money too. Again, nothing venal about it. They're trying to make money. And ESG investment funds push back to services. Can you come up with even better indices because both groups can make more money? Now, of course, there are also ESG consultants. The McKinsey's, the BCG's, the Bain's are not sitting on the sidelines. They see an opportunity to enter the space. And what are they going to do? They're looking at how ESG services rank companies. They're looking at how ESG investments are made. And then they go to companies and say, hey, we can help you improve, improve your disclosure scores or improve your standing with investors. And of course, they get fees for doing this and they advise companies on disclosure and what to do to make themselves look better on an ESG score. Everybody in this grouping at least is making money. The accounting firms, the measurement services, the investment funds, the consulting firms, and there are side beneficiaries including academics who get funds from ESG you know, slush funds. You know, BlackRock alone probably can fund in entire universities with extra money that's, that's sloshing around. A lot of people are making money, but somebody's got to be paying for this gravy, right? It doesn't create itself. And guess what? This gravy is being paid for by shareholders and companies, sometimes by taxpayers. We can get the government to kick in. And the question is, why are corporate CEOs t sitting on the sidelines and letting this happen? I hate to say this, but corporate CEOs, I think, love this movement because, I mean, after all, these are the same CEOs who in 2019 put out what I thought was uh, the worst thought through and written document I've ever seen where they, put, where they argued in, you know, through the business roundtable composed of 171 of the, the, the CEOs of the biggest companies in the U.S., where they argued that a company's responsibility is to make everybody happy. Make everybody happy. Who's everybody? Stakeholders, employees, uh, society, customers. And I argued then that this was absurd. Not only can you never keep everyone happy, it's a recipe for everybody to be unhappy, but it was also a rule book where... It's, you know, you could avoid accountability. No, a CEO who's focused on stakeholder wealth maximization is accountable to no one because you can always use another stakeholder as an excuse. And in some cases, I think that um, flaunting your goodness has become a way in which um, founders and CEOs have, um, can, can cover up some really weak-looking business models and in some cases commit outright fraud. I remember writing in 2015, about Theranos. That time I pointed to how Elizabeth Holmes, in her pitch for the company, always made a big deal about how much the company, you know, how much the company cared about society and how much they'd make the world a better place by offering their blood testing products for free to poor countries that couldn't afford it. In 2019, when I was talking about the WeWork IPO, again, I pointed out that this whole company seemed to be have been built on the notion of we, how it's a collective consciousness they cared about, which struck me as incredibly ironic because Adam Newman was the most narcissistic person I've ever seen. No. But both Theranos and WeWork, I think, used goodness, their noble purpose as a shield that people, that they hid behind, that they hid weak business models behind. Now, if you're in the ESG space, don't take this personally. I'm not suggesting you're being venal for being an ESG, that your end game here is to make money. I'm sure many of the people 
in the ESG space, who work in ESG, have the best of intentions. They want to make the world a better place. But here's what I want you to think about. If you turn over, if the spokespersons for ESG are corporate CEOs and investment fund titans, don't you think you've lost the storyline here? That you've been co-opted in a way where what you care about very quickly is going to be displaced by what they put in front? Now, the old saying about waking up with fleas when you lie down with dogs is very relevant here. Look around you. Look at the people who are loudest, the loudest voices for ESG. And you should be terrified about where ESG is going. So let me finish on a more positive note. We all want to be good. We have value systems and often we struggle with this this question about morality versus money. And this is not, not something we discovered. This has always been true. We all want to be good and we all want to make a decent living. So let me suggest you a roadmap. And this is not a roadmap for companies. It's a roadmap for you and me. So it's a roadmap I'm trying to follow. I'm not always faithful for it. But now here's what I would suggest. If you want to be good and you want to bring that goodness into your decision making, you have to remember goodness is personal. You have to bring in your value system. You have to think about what you care about and what you don't care about. And don't let the rest of the world tell you this is what is good because this is your judgment to make. You can't leave this up to ESG services. You want to value in good companies, you've got to do your own homework because your definition of goodness is not going to be the same as MSCI's definition of goodness. If you're a business person and you own your own business, you have complete freedom to bring into your business everything that you value in good. So if you want to give away half of your earnings every year to the poor, the homeless, the sick, by all means do so. It's your company. But if you're an employee for a publicly traded company, a manager or a CEO, it doesn't matter how high up you're in the ranks, and you're using corporate money to do good, Remember, you're investing other people's money. And if you chase, choose to make decisions based on your value system, you're replacing their moral code with your own. And if you decide to do that, at the very minimum, you've got to be transparent about it. You can't just do hand waving and say, trust me, I'm doing good. You've got to let me buy into your definition of goodness. So as businesses, I think we face this challenge of, you know, should we be taking over individual choices on morality and making them corporate choices? If you're an investor and you're interested in bringing goodness into investing, remember that the basis for investing is pricing. You've got to at least get a sense of what's priced in, what's not priced in. And if goodness is priced in, you've got to be realistic and accept that if you want to be good, Guess what? You're going to make a lower return and you're okay with that. And finally, as a consumer and a citizen, you have choices to make that need to be consistent with your moral code. So if your pet issue is climate change, by all means, don't, no, don't invest in ExxonMobil, buy green energy stocks. But then if you jump into your gas guzzling SUV, you drive home to a house that you keep air conditioned at 60 degrees, you're being you know, hypocritical about caring for climate change. So your consumption, consumption decisions on what products and services you want to buy and your citizenship decisions on who you vote for and community participation, I think have a much bigger impact in society than who you invest in or what you lecture about in terms of goodness. So I'm going to close with, um, with a few personal notes. First is, now, maybe it's just my limited exposure to people, but in my experience, the truly good people I've run into in my lifetime don't spend any of their time talking about how good they are or lecturing people on goodness. Now, how much time did Mother Teresa spend telling people she was a good person? She didn't have to because she did good. So I'm always skeptical when somebody keeps talking about their goodness. And I extend that skepticism to companies and investment funds that spend hundreds of pages telling me how good they are. You're protesting too much. You're telling me too You're spending too much time telling me how, much, how good you are or how much good you do. I don't know. I would worry about whether you're truly good. Now, my biggest problem with ESG is that it's done a disservice 
to the people that it claims to help. In fact, the disservice is it's telling people who are torn between morality and money that they can have it all. In what sense? They're telling companies that they can be good and be more valuable. Always. They're telling investors they can be good and earn higher returns. They're telling young job seekers that they can be paid like bankers while working Peace Corps jobs. And that's delusional. The long term, I think being good, you know, I, th I think in the long term first, this sales pitch of you can be good and you can make more money is going to create cynicism. And, and it'll do more harm than good if your end game is to make society a better place. Because the truth is, being good will cost you money, will create inconvenience. And that if you're a good person, you choose to be good in spite of those costs and inconveniences. You can't have your cake and eat it too. I hope you found the session useful. And I thank you very much for listening.